Good evening, everyone. It's good to see so many uh, faces of squares here today. I'm really excited about this topic. Um, this is one that's uh, near and dear, and I'm really help hopeful for all that we're going to be discussing today. My name is Madhu Singh. I'm in the president of here of Thai Seattle. Um, we have a really stellar panel of wonderful women leading great companies here in the Northwest region. I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone here today and just if you don't know about Thai, hopefully today you'll get a taste of what we're about. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering entrepreneurship here uh, globally, but also specifically here in the Northwest region. Our focus is on inspiring and equipping entrepreneurs for success. Uh, we do that through this programming like this and a whole host of other events from uh, educational institutes to um, weekend a kind of uh, startup related activity, pitch competitions. One-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, sessions with different mentors, and right now we're actually fish, uh, wrapping up a CEO cohort that's our first of its kind. And so lots of different activity here, as much as we can do virtually and hybrid, and looking to do some more um, in the coming weeks and year-end, as well as uh, into next year. Uh, we have a couple of board members here today, if you could wave. Uh, we have Kishore and Gauri and Sharish. And I think a few more will be joining us. They'll be, these three men actually will be your co-hosts later in uh, the breakout sessions after we finish up with the panel. The three ladies I'd like to introduce to you are Pradna Desh, CEO yeah. of Advocate AI, Ratna Sharad, CEO of Flavor Cloud, and Ambika Singh, CEO of Amwar Style. Uh, these three have kindly uh, dedicated their time this afternoon to share a little bit about their journey um, and also take some questions. So I've prepared a handful of questions that's going to allow them to share a bit about their background and how they got to where they're at. Um, and if you have any questions for the panelists, feel free to put them in the chat window and we'll do our best to get to them. So um, maybe we could, the first question I have will allow everyone to give a more formal introduction. Uh, maybe Pradnia, you could kick us off and tell us about uh, your entrepreneurial journey that got you here to advocate AI and what continues to inspire you today. Thank you, Madhu. So my entrepreneurial journey, I have to say, has been long and winding what, as to what got me here. I started my career off as a CIA analyst, um, analyzing economic trends um, in, in Washington, D.C., actually, at Langley. Um, and I, one of the things that I did was analyze economic negotiations, trade negotiations. And then in doing that, I thought that was interesting, but I didn't want to just be in the back analyzing it. I wanted to be in the front, actually negotiating the agreements. So then I took the foreign service exam and became a U.S. diplomat and represented the United States at different places around the world. And the last posting was in Geneva, Switzerland at the World Trade Organization and loved doing that, loved um, negotiating with other countries on trade agreements. Um, and so then at the end of that, um, I was supposed to take another tour. I thought uh, we, we had our third baby at the time. And so he was born in Geneva. And I decided that I actually wanted to take two years to kind of catch my breath. <laughs> and then after that, um, to go on to the next tour. So I ended up going to Seattle because I could go anywhere while I was home. And so we went to Seattle um, while catching my breath. It, it turned out that I was really comfortable, really liked Seattle, really liked the entrepreneurial community there and started a law firm. So and that's mother when we met back in, I guess that was 2008, maybe something like that when we met. Um, so uh, I um, ran the law firm for several years and we had enterprise clients and um, among others. And in working with the enterprise clients, legal clients, um, I saw that they, first of all, they're really busy. They're handling so many things that's on their plate. And we handled a little portion of what they did for them. But within, within a company, the legal department, you might be surprised, it's not the most popular of the company um, because um, it's often thought that it's legal that slows things down rather than actually gets things done. And so I really wanted to help them. I felt, I felt really bad for them that that was a challenge that they were facing. And so we tried to, to do that on the law firm side and then realized that the solution was actually on the technology side of things. So I set out to figure out that problem for them, to figure out what they could do to do their jobs better. And that led to launching Advocate AI. Thank you. That's really great. Uh, Ratna, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, 
So that was super inspiring. So my journey had a lot of um, different turns that uh, led me to logistics. Uh, it's not something that you just dive into. Um, so my background, um, I started as an engineer, um, a developer in the supply chain logistics industry, um, and then moved to product. I've been leading product organizations for the last 20 years or more. Um, I started the first decade um, in supply chain logistics, working for carriers, forwarders, 3PLs, uh, third-party logistics providers. Um, and what I did was cross-border route optimization, supply chain optimization technology um, around the world. So North America, Asia, Europe. Um, I also got to work with customs organizations, defining trade tariff regulatory contracts and what they should look like uh, from a technology standpoint. Um, I love massive business um, business problems and what technology can do to solve that. So I think that's the thread um, through my career. So I went from, so that was Portland, Oregon for 10 years. Then I moved to Seattle uh, for family. Um, and instead of taking a role in transportation um, at Amazon, I chose um, a tiny little startup because I was really intrigued by the online um, space um, within Microsoft. So I was one of the founding members of the ad platform team. We were a dozen that built uh, the platform that eventually became Bing Ads and about uh, 3 billion when I left. Um, and so um, I owned the advertiser stack. So it was an essentially marketplace monetization and ad platform. Got to work with um, the Amazons and Ebays of the world all the way down to SMB. Um, got fascinated by how we were helping make that connection between brand and consumer through ads. And at the same time, my own personal experience, I shop a lot. I travel a lot um, and buy from international brands. And it was um, so horrendous the experience as a consumer that it got me thinking about why my past life uh, enabling cross-border did not translate to a great B2C consumer experience that we were powering at Microsoft. Um, I felt best suited to solve the problem because logistics and technology, that intersection is, is pretty much, I think, a few people and I'm one of them. <laughs> so um, it started um, my first company along with my co-founder, uh, who used to be my developer at Bing Ads. Uh, it was called Runway to Street. It was a marketplace that enabled small and medium brands sell internationally. We scaled to over 300 brands across 100 countries selling to 200. Uh, and we found um, a couple things. One is that uh, it wasn't an SMB problem. It really was, um, you know, the, the larger the brand, the more complexity and the more need for a specialist cross-border uh, logistics provider. Um, and then the second thing was that we didn't set out to build a backend anywhere to anywhere logistics, but that's what we needed to do to power the marketplace because nothing in the market worked. Um, and then we saw that um, larger brands wanted to leverage our logistics, um, but they didn't really belong or want to be in the marketplace. So that led to the creation of Flavor Cloud. We took the backend technology, created super simple um, services that any brand anywhere in the world can plug in and offer a seamless international shipping experience. So that's what we do. We make uh, international shipping easy, affordable, and friction free. Thank you. That's really great to hear how your background has come, has brought you to this particular point of time. Uh, what about you, Ambika? Um, so I loved hearing both of you that the uh, consistent thread is how, you know, many experiences seem to come together to um, birth these amazing companies and founders. And so um, really cool to hear both of you kind of give your journey. I'll, I'll do sim something similar and take you way back. Um, so as many of you know, I'm from an entrepreneurial family in Thai, Seattle. There's a one guy that you might know who I think is on the Zoom <laughs> who's done some entrepreneurial stuff. So um, growing up, it was very much part of uh, who we were as a family. There was ventures being started and exciting things. And I think as especially as a child, I saw the part of it that has stuck with me as um, the part that I love the most, which is building something with a group of people who you really like and have shared values with and a shared commitment to um, creating something from nothing. Um, that part of it as a kid, the, these people who worked in um, my dad's companies would 
come to our house for dinner. They were our family friends. Their children are my friends. And this sort of like very community kind of aspect that gets built authentically when you're working together to build something that you all believe in um, was really attractive to me and continues to be so. Um, I saw that again uh, as a youngster when I uh, I was actually the first class to graduate from a school that for the East Siders you've probably heard of now, International Community School um, was started by uh, the, the class that graduated with me. So I spent six years there. Um, we started in little portables in the back of a um, a more established high school with like no books and like some teachers with a dream and um, parents who were really committed. So many kind of like startup threads there. Um, and I was the first like class president. Um, so I got to kind of like take that type of leadership role um, as we were coming together to pick the um, the fight song and the uh, the motto and um, together we rise, I still remember. So I think th those things, um, both of those experiences were really foundational for me and um, showed me kind of like the power of being able to bring a group of people together um, and what belief and hard work can do. Uh, then from there, I was um, I went to undergrad out in the middle of nowhere, but not um, middle of nowhere, close to here. So I went to New Hampshire for school. I'm a Dartmouth undergrad, and I came back to Seattle um, to work at Microsoft, which was not a startup, <laughs> of course. But I found a really small group, um, kind of like similar to Rathna, how you found a small corner there. Um, we were working on a student technology competition, which at the time was the world's largest student technology competition. So once again, uh, every year we would bring together 80 teams, best and brightest from all of these different amazing countries, many of whom had never even been on a plane before, um, who were building apps and solutions uh, to really change the communities that um, they were a part of. And so I loved my, my time at Microsoft um, and really kind of probably consciously, subconsciously added more fuel to my entrepreneurial fire. Um, and so from there, I left Microsoft and I um, worked at a travel startup, uh, which some of you may remember called Travel Post. The old Expedia gang kind of got back together and um, it was foundational for a different reason than I expected. Um, the company scaled super fast from a hiring and kind of like a uh, fundraising perspective, but never really kind of crystallized on um, the original premise. And so uh, I think of the 17 people who worked there after a year or so, uh, 12 were let go in one day. Um, and I was one of the 12. And it was like so devastating at 24 or 25 or whatever it was. Um, that I went on this spirit quest with my product manager and we thought, you know, we had really seen the underbelly of the business world. And, uh, and you know, when things went wrong, like now we had sort of seen all of the worst case scenarios, which of course um, at 24, I didn't really have full um, appreciation for what underbellies really look like. But I think it was foundational from the perspective of like, okay, now I had lived through um, a, a real kind of like failure and it wasn't so bad. Um, I still walked out with great relationships and a great experience and, um, everybody got new jobs and the spirit quest was really fun. We drove down highway one and saw a lot of cool vistas from our aching hearts. Um, and so I, and I came back, so I was sort of like renewed, uh, excited about, um, small companies and building things. Um, and so from there I went to Rover, which I'm very excited that people have heard of now because at the time it was me in a dog park uh, being rained on, trying to convince people, many of you who actually took a chance on us, which I really appreciate, <laughs> um, and let us sit your dogs. So that was it was another kind of like really cool um, way to see, uh, you know, a company go from something to nothing. Marketplaces are hard, but um, when they start to click, they're they're pretty amazing. So um I went to business school after that at Sloan um, in Boston, and uh, I knew I wanted to start something, and I didn't know what that thing was. Uh, and so I spent two years there doing all sorts of interesting things, meeting cool people, um, and learning a lot. MIT is, of course, like an amazing place to um, just absorb cool stuff that's going on. And so um, through lots of kind of like twists and turns and trying weird different ideas across the spectrum, 
the one that really seemed to stick for me um, as a founder uh, was Armoire. And so Armoire is um, the dream closet. And what that means is that we uh, curate for our customers using um, personalization data that they give to us through reviews, both about fit and style. And we take the infinity of our closet, um, which is uh, 50,000 plus items, and recommend things to them that we know um, will be interesting to them because it fits their style and um, fit preferences. We use uh, kind of machine learning algorithms that um, are it's actually really incredibly applicable um, for those machine learning kind of geeks uh, when we think about exploration and exploitation, it actually it is really applicable to fashion because we want to help you explore on the edges of your preference set um, while still keeping you sort of like safe and happy with your black dress of your dreams. Um, so we curate for you and we marry that with a rental model so that women are able to keep um, the variety that they want in their closet and we're also able to feed our very hungry algorithm with more volume of data than anybody else because we're sending our customers thousands of items and they're giving us a review on every single one. So that kind of like cool combination between solving for um, the desire for rent for a variety and also solving for the help me navigate the infinity um, disaster called uh, e-commerce and brick and mortar commerce and fashion. Um, those two things have proven to be exciting for us. And I see some of my armoire customers on the screen. So the last part, I think kind of that is consistent with um, how I ended up here is it is an incredible honor to serve the boss ladies um, around the country who we do. We tend to uh, focus on a working woman, very often mom, very often super busy, and um, the ability to add a little bit of uh, joy to her life on a daily basis. It continues to be incredibly inspiring for me and for um, our great team. Great. Thank you. It's it was really inspiring to hear all of you and kind of how the different things that we, in your past that shaped to where you are now. Uh, this is a slightly different question I had in mind next was, uh, you know, we, we've heard the statistics of women-led businesses. We hear they're, you know, it's a consistent kind of grim information, but hearing the three of you is, has been interesting because it, it sounded like there was a, a lot of like different um, signs that put you where you're at. But I imagine there was some doubt and there was some concern before you started, kind of made this leap. Um, could you share a little bit about what it, what some of those things were and how you kind of overcame them to kind of really focus on the business that you have now? Maybe uh, Ratna, you can go first. Get off mute, yeah. Um, yeah, so for me, I think, um, you know, when I think about this question, um, rather than doubt, it was much more about um, the belief that, you know, if I didn't try this, if I didn't give it a go, um, I would be disappointed with that, not so much with failure. I think that's the only thing. Um, I didn't want any regrets. Um, I didn't know that it would succeed. Um, and so when I originally started, it was runway to street. That was the marketplace that that um, I quit Microsoft and I, I jumped into the startup world. Um, I don't come from an entrepreneurial background. I didn't know I wanted to be one, but this was a problem that, you know, I did um, as a product manager, you kind of, you know, start with a napkin math and then you kind of say, this is the opportunity. And I could see signs that in 10 years, the world is going to be so connected. E-commerce is going to be global. I could see the signs and I felt like I was best suited. Um, and if I didn't try this, um, I'd be very disappointed. Um, so that's really what drove me. Um, and, um, you know, I'm pretty fearless that way. Okay. You have to be to jump in and yeah. do this, not knowing where it's going to go. I mean, you still don't know, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Pratnia, do you want to go share? Sure. So for me, it was focusing on the problem. I was it was so focused on the problem that uh, our potential customers had that I, just, I really wanted to jump in there and solve it. And I also saw that some legal tech companies were started by tech people, but not necessarily attorneys who got the problem. And so that frustrated me. And so, and, they, and those companies would last a year and a half, two years or so. 
And then they wouldn't necessarily know why it didn't work. And then um, the enterprise legal departments would explain to me that nobody gets us. And I thought, well, I do. So I thought it was the right time to jump in. I love that. What about you, uh, Ambika? Also still relearning the Zoom um, mute problems. <laughs> uh, I'll echo the same. I mean, I think that being able to solve a problem that I found inspiring with a group of people that um, really were committed to it uh, continues to be um, great fuel. And so there's a question from the audience that seems fitting for right now. Um, how did, was it, what was the biggest factor that helped you make the crossover from arguably a safe role that you were in at various at these various companies to kind of the leap into entrepreneurship? Uh, oh, sorry, Ambika, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I mean, I think it was kind of like uh, probably twofold, both from an opportunity and. Um, in a, a fear perspective, and I'll tell you, I'll start with that because it's more, it's a bit of a funny story. So uh, the the travel startup I left Microsoft for was um, being kind of shepherded at the time by Rich Barton, who um, is a multi-time, very successful entrepreneur. And uh, when he was interviewing me, this he took a page from the Apple playbook and he was like, so, you know, do you want to be 40 and like still at Microsoft? Now that I am almost 40, it sounds like less terrifying. But at the time I was like, oh, he was like, you know, you'll be this like mid-level manager. You'll still be like pushing papers around and like doing a lot of email. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do any more email. <laughs> of course, now I do a lot of email still. But um, I think there was some part of that where it was sort of like, oh man, where, how am I going to sort of like make the impact in my career that I really want to? Um, and do I see the ability to do that in the larger corporate structure? So I would say that was kind of like the, the negative part. Um, on the on the positive side, I think it's more like, uh, again, sort of like back to being inspired by the problem. Um, it felt like this was the the kind of like the things coming together where there was like a real problem with a consumer group that I really cared about. Um, and the, um, the inspiration of doing that sort of was bigger than the fear of failure. Totally. I love that. Uh, Pradhina, do you want to go next? I would echo all of that. I, I think especially the desire to make an impact. It's just, and I also echo what Ratna said before is not wanting to regret um, knowing, having the answer or having, well, I, I shouldn't say having the answers, having one of many answers um, in my hand um, and not just going for it. I would have regretted that the rest of my life and I, I didn't want to be in that position. Yeah, definitely. What about you, Ratna, same? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with both of them. Um, I think, you know, for me, um, I didn't jump immediately. I sat on this for two years. It was just in my head. I couldn't get it out of my head. I, I just had to go do. Um, and I think um, more than anything else, I was ready for um, a higher rate of learning. That's how I think about when I switched to a completely different industry. It's because I want to go learn something. I think about, you know, there are times in life where you want to move that up to 60, 70% new things. It just um, is very addicting. It's like, you know, nothing about a lot of things. And then um, you kind of go figure it all out. And, and that's what's um, most enticing, I think, about this startup mm -hmm. world. Great. Um, so this, this question's a bit different. You know, all of you, all three of you are definitely, you know, leading the way um, in this business, all in tech, um, kind of some or in a, a technology space, which, as we know, is kind of dominant in uh, one gender or the other. But what's what I'm curious about is if you've experienced any of the so-called double standard that tends to be out there for men and women. Um, and, and if you have uh, if you have a favorite one that you experienced, that was kind of an interesting play. Uh, seeing how far all three of you have come, I imagine you've kind of um, smashed that standard, <laughs> for lack of a better way to say that. But um, is there one that comes to mind for you, maybe, Ambika? Um, I, that's a great question. Uh, and I think um, for me, the the most kind of like 
prevalent one that I, I'm not sure that I have smashed, but um, I, certainly I'm more cognizant of is especially in the early stages of businesses. And this I'm thinking about like in particularly in the fundraising arena at early stages of businesses, angel investors are taking a chance on the founder or the founding team, the idea, the problem space, but the, it's not, unfortunately, uh, the spreadsheet yet because there is no spreadsheet. So businesses are evaluated at somewhat of a gut level and that has been the biggest hurdle for me in terms of the fact that like we are pitching a product that um, for a reason right now is directed towards the boss lady and not the boss man. Uh, because I have explained to many a men why once you find the perfect shirt, you wouldn't buy it in 16 colors. Because that <laughs> concept of like why you would want to keep trying these shirts that might not fit you, but are going to be a little different than the shirt you wore yesterday um, doesn't translate quite as well into, um, across, across both gender lines. So in, you know, in all the traditional sort of like, uh, spaces. And so that to me has been the biggest hurdle. And I think the way that I've learned to, um, kind of, uh, circumvent it is multifold. One is to find female investors. Um, and I have been very fortunate about that. Um, and a lot of my female investors started as my customers, um, and so they use the product, love the product, uh, and thought, you know, how do I kind of get more involved? Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I have had su success doing is to create allies in the home of uh, male investors, often in the form of their wife using the product or their daughter using the product. Um, but to essentially what you're trying to replicate is like, what is the gut on that, um, on that business? And this is particular from a, uh, in a consumer space, right? I think where that translates to the founder themselves is like all of us pattern match. Um, I look different than the other eight founders that walked into the investor's office um, earlier that morning. So like when they're pattern matching to uh, the last five successful exits that they had, me as a founder looks different. And so I think, you know, those are sort of like realities. They're certainly not um, insurmountable, uh, but figuring out like how we get more women to jump into um this space across um, the whole value chain, not just at sort of the founder level, but certainly at the capital level and at all levels of leadership so that CFOs start to look different and CTOs start to look different, I think is a really important part of it. And um, ultimately, again, like thinking about consumer, but it, it translates like women are huge consumers of um, services and of products that get built. And so the arbitrage opportunity to build something for a customer group, if you are um, looking at, uh, at a, a, an all-female team or even a partially female team, that person has an opportunity to look at the problem differently. And so I really think this is like a case of still, it's an undertapped talent, undertapped problem space where um, we can make really outsized financial returns across the spectrum if we can get people to sort of jump in the pool and participate. Thank you. Uh, Ratha, do you want to share a little bit? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree um, on the pattern matching. I think that's one of the things, and especially uh, when it comes to uh, pitches, uh, early stage, especially, um, that was one of the, the hurdles. So um, the way, you know, a specific example of um, that would be the first 30 seconds, you really want to walk in and talk about your product. That's how you're making um, a decision. You pretty much, you know, um, make or break in the 30 seconds. Um, but I spend the first 30 seconds building credibility about me, um, why I am a tech founder, what's my background, how did I get here? Because um, I don't want you to think um, that, you know, I don't fit the profile. And that to me is a disservice. I'd rather talk about the business just like, you know, uh, guys do. Um, but, you know, I, I figured a way around it. And, you know, I tell my story that weaves in uh, a lot of the business. Um, so just something um, that gets you every single time. Thank you. Pradhya? So my answer is going to be the same as theirs. It's funding. It's the um, an early stage funding, which is all I've done because we are an early stage company and um, getting the getting the credibility right at the beginning. But beyond that is just is 
is raising, raising the round, closing the deal um, and talking, uh, making sure that you're talking about what, what you want to talk about in the company. I actually have to say, I took a training on this because I, I had heard, I had read that only 2.2% of venture um, capital goes to female founders and was concerned that that would be a, a big problem as I went to raise. And so at Astra Ventures down in San Diego has this training for female founders on, oh, when they ask you this, answer that, which I thought would be strange but actually worked really well is that um, because and I actually thought that the people who asked me would notice, but they apparently didn't. So th this this training helped me to make sure that I got the message about why the company is great to invest in and why this team is exactly the right one to solve the problem. Um, so I guess that was a double standard, but I, I tried to work my right way around it through um, turning the questions around. Thank you. That's really interesting. It's interesting that you kind of all have experienced it at the same level. And that's mostly what we hear about a lot of the chatter around um, investing, raising investing, raising capital. Um, these days, there's a lot of focus, as many of you have heard of, um, having more women on boards of directors and uh, funds dedicated to only investing in women-led businesses have come up even in our region more recently. Um, and I'm curious, like in terms of from when you started to now, uh, even kind of going back before you even got started in a startup, like, do you do you feel like these are uh, going in the right direction? Do you feel like there's more opportunity now than there has been um, in the past? And like, do you feel like in, if there was a milestone um, in your mind before we could say, yes, women are in equal footing in the investment space, at least, what would that look like? Any thoughts on that? Anyone want to jump in first? I, I would love to just uh, the you, the comment you made about like how, do I feel like things are changing on on the positive note which has persisted since I started um, and continues to be so I do think that the camaraderie amongst women in startup spaces is incredibly strong and it it's an advantage a distinct advantage because women have come to bat for me in all sorts of different ways that I know that they wouldn't have um, had I been a man. So I, I think that there is a counterpart where there may not be many. So we've still got a numbers problem, but uh, considering the, the fact that there are few, um, they are loud and conscious. I mean, Rathna and me have been friends for a long time. She, in her incredibly busy schedule has been a strong mentor to me all along the way. And I know that you took time out of your busy life to help me along because um, it was important to you and important to the value. So I think that it be not afraid to, to the women who are watching because like the, uh, there is an advantage that comes along with um, who you are. And so it's not all sort of a bleak picture. Fantastic. I well, uh, I'll say, you know, yes, I think, uh, you know, women definitely, um, we don't have that network, right? Um, that's the thing that, that's missing. You don't have the network that men do um, in the VC circles or in the startup circles. And, um, you know, so it's something we need to do. And I see that happening a lot more now. Um, Seattle has a much more robust uh, community now around um, startups and women specifically. Um, but I also think that for there to be meaningful change, you need, we need men allies that are championing, right? Um, we're very small in numbers and, and really we need that happening as well, um, which I see in different um, circles as well, but I think we need more of that uh, if we really want to see change. And it needs to happen across the board. It, it, it's about thinking about diversity. You know, Ambika talked about um, the investment community. What do they look like? You know, I think about cap table diversity. I think about board diversity. I think about my suppliers. What kind of diversity are they representing? So that along the way, I'm, I'm uh, championing with my dollars. <laughs> you know, where where I spend my money. I'm like, are you doing that? Are you hiring? Um, for diversity, do you have those values represented? Then you know I can spend the money with you, <laughs> whether it's a legal team or something else. I'm asking those questions. Kanye, do you want to add anything to that? 
Only that I agree that there it's not a bleak picture in that there are there are allies. There are a lot of people that are helping female founders and um, to, to use the, that uh, to use the advantage of that. There are people who are um, helping to give advice. There are funds that are focused on female founders. There are accelerators that help. And I found so um, we started. Um, I guess we 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 closed our um, seed round in April, and right around that time, I I, I used the All Raise program, their pre seed accelerator. The Women in Cloud um, went through their accelerator. D- Davis Wright and M twelve has a um, female um, SaaS um, accelerator. We, we I think I did everything just because I to reference point earlier knew that I needed to learn a whole lot. Um, but in in doing that, I also found so many people that are were helping along the way. And really appreciate that that's the environment that I found. That's really great to hear. It's inspiring to hear that because I remember, uh, you know, I'm the owner of a law firm. And um, in the early years of my practice, uh, it was other women that were really most difficult to deal with. And I was always men, even to now, uh, except for maybe someone like Pradnia, it's most of my mentors tend to be male. Um, but I would agree that since that time, I think people like me, who experienced that maybe made it more of a focused effort not to do that to the next group. So 10, 12 years later, I won't be that person to someone else. I'll be the person who's championing it. I'm kind of, it gives me hope that all of you have experienced that same thing over the last however many years um, as well. Uh, You know, speaking of mentors and people who kind of uh, hold you up in all this, can you share a little bit of perhaps about the role of mentors play in your respective businesses? Um, and if you, if you feel like any recommendations for the audience, cause I understand when you're kind of younger in your career, that's one of the harder things to come about is mentors to help you kind of raise you up and push you forward. Um, Ambika, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, just one follow-up point before I answer yours, uh, your question directly that I think the, um, your point about like how women are taking it upon themselves to change. I think that that is super important. And so like us having these kinds of conversations, like in, in these forums where we think about like, how are we consciously going to make sure that we support each other or, and this is related to your mentorship conversation. How do we consciously make sure we encourage women who are one foot in the pond and one foot out of the pond. How do we say like, Hey, it's not so scary out here. You've got a great idea. If it doesn't work, you're going to have another great idea. And we're all going to be on here on the sidelines, like cheering you on. And, um, to the, to Rathna, to your point about like networks and the way that perhaps like five men around the table are different than five women around the table. That's like where I have found a lot of, um, I guess, strength direction mentorship is my immediate circle of women. My friends really have been great mentors to me and great cheerleaders because uh, our dinner conversations tend to be a lot about the businesses that we're running or the businesses that we work at. And so this stereotype of sort of like business and money being off the table at in women's circles where we're just sort of like, you know, talking about how we redesigned our couch, like that doesn't seem to be my um, experience. And I think that that's really important because like, certainly when I was thinking about starting this business, it wasn't like I woke up one morning and I was like, today I'm going to do it. Just similar to what both of you said, I sat on it for years um, and I was terrified. I continue to be terrified. Um, And so you need the people around you, your spouse, your family, your best friends to be your mentors and your cheerleaders and to remind you that um, you've got what it takes and it's not so scary if it doesn't work, all that kind of stuff. And so to answer your question directly, I think I've been fortunate to find mentors in um, my closest circles and sort of sometimes they've gone both ways where I meet someone more professionally and they become friends. But my advice about like, what what should the line be between like who your mentors are and who your close personal circles are? It, in my case, I think it should be very blurry because you need to really have a relationship where you're investing back and forth both ways and you're both sort of like being able to gain from the conversation. And so the the places where I haven't seen it work so well is like the um the kind of cold and I've done it and been on the receiving end of it where you know somebody sends you a note um or I send someone a note and I'm like hey I'd really like you to be my mentor 
we, there's not a lot of context there for us to come up together and like have that deep relationship that you need. Whereas like, if you look for people who are closer to you, I think mm-hmm. at least in my experience, it has worked better. Um, Prathi or Bethan, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I'll completely agree with that. Um, you know, it has to be your network. For me, it's it, it's personal network, but but um, it's also uh, people I've worked with. Um, I collect people along the way, and these are my biggest champions. They're the ones that you know. There are they're on my you know. I text them. <laughs> it's like for a response on something. Um, each one of my mentors is great at something, and they're always. Um, my, um, you know, extended team, if you will. Um, and so that, that's an incredible place to be. And these are relationships that, you know, whether it started in prior careers or, you know, we've, I've known most of them for decades. Um, and so um, it's about personal relationships and they add different dimension um, to your business, your life. Um, it could just be that, you know, you just want to talk something through. Um, it helps with all of those. And they're also my friends. Um, so that, that's basically what I would recommend you do with mentorship. Do you want anything, add anything else, Pranya? I was going to only add, so I came from a different world than when I launched the startup and I came from government. And so coming from government, I, I love the people that I worked with, but they don't know anything about um, that's helpful to what I'm doing now, even though they're dear personal friends and, and love talking to them. So I had to find mentors in a different way. Which, and that's the reason why I joined a lot of the programs. And I would be amiss to not mention the program that Sharish ran through Thai Seattle, because that was fantastic in learning a lot of the things that I needed to know along the way and appreciate appreciate the, the knowledge that I gained from that and also the people that I met there and were able to include as mentors. And so I would say that it's wonderful if your own network and your own past um, brought mentors for you, but if not, it's okay. There, there are other ways um, to find them and that's by proactively reaching out to these programs and going through the accelerators and meeting people along the way there. Thank you. I'll give a plug for Thai as a great place to connect with people who make great mentors. Uh, as a platform, as an organization, we try to create spaces for that to happen. So if you know if you don't necessarily have the same circles or hang out with entrepreneurs and you're looking for some of that opportunity, you know, reach out. That's why organizations like us are around because we don't we don't. It's not a solo journey, as you've heard all along. It's a journey of a collective and about um, helping each other and supporting each other through these opportunities. Um, there's some a, a couple of interesting questions from the audience I thought you guys might enjoy sharing, um, kind of going back to a little bit about the work you're doing and kind of how your journey started. Um, this one I'm curious about as well. Um, you know, a couple of you, I think uh, both uh, Rathna and Ambika kind of commented about how you either were in a different startup or you st- were with the startup in your early days before you did your own, this particular business. Um, and I, they're curious as to whether or not, well, whether or not it really served as a stepping stone to your own startup, or if it had um, given all that you were privy to in that, in that experience, um, or was there something else that really drove you to doing your own uh, startup as well? Yeah, uh, so f- for me, it was um, actually the, both of those were my, I mean, this is my second startup is the way to think about it. Um, but the first one really led to the second one. Um, it was the learnings from the first one um, that um, essentially we took the back end logistics, what we would learned and applied it towards um, a service, if you will, that had um, massive global scale um, and really didn't um didn't need anybody to participate in the marketplace. So we kind of um, changed how we thought about the logistics problem um, and really thought about it as ground up anywhere to anywhere um, powering logistics, um, which again, if we didn't do the, the first startup, I don't think we would have gotten here. Um, mm-hmm. So um, we didn't know we would get here, but it was just a very interesting way of getting here that, that really gave us a quick um, scale, if you will. 
Great. Uh, Ambika, do you want to add to that from your experience? Yeah. I mean, for me, I think it, it really helped because, uh, I think about like, I also went to business school and business school, you read like a two page case on a company. And, uh, those things are supposed to teach you life lessons into uh, how you should run your own company or be a great manager. Working in a startup is like a very extended, very intense version of reading a case study that you actually participate in and build in. And it's actually a good uh, tie into the last question too. And I see some comments um, in the chat about like, well, how do you build those circles? I think Rathna made this point as well um, uh, about the fact that like, as you go through your career, if you put yourself in places where you can find those people who then become your mentors, like that's an example of authentically building a relationship that um, can stick with you through your career more so than the kind of like cold LinkedIn message. Um, so I think that that's, for me, it, it was a really important part of, um, my journey and also of creating the circle around me that helps me to be successful. Great. Thank you. We've talked a lot about, uh, mentors so far, and we talked a little bit about the kind of the standards that kind of go around with investing. I'm curious the role it's actual investors, all three of you have raised money at this point, um, that role actual investors play in your business and whether um, they're, you're getting kind of support that you expected to get out of that relationship. Bradley, anyone who go first? Sure. Um, I, I guess, didn't know what to expect out of that relationship um, because it was my first time raising money, but have been really pleased by the support that we get from our investors, especially, so we, we raised our seed round. And so we have one venture um, investment and in, in the rest are, are angels. And so especially the, the venture um, fund is just the professionalism that they bring to the conversation. And so uh, they, it started out, they'd ask questions that I, I had I didn't even know what those questions, I didn't even understand the questions, but in understanding the questions and, and getting answers to the questions, it helped to really um, make, just to grow the business, to help understand what I needed to do and what kind of answers that I really should be having. Maybe I should have a dashboard of all of these these uh, numbers that this the RVC is asking us for every month. And now I do. Um, so it the, the support um, somewhat was from the questions um, asked, but then after the answers is from the real connections um, that the investors are making for us and the being part of the team in bringing solutions. So I appreciate all of it. And I didn't know that that was something that I should expect, but I'm glad that that's what, what happened. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Retha, Abiga, did you have similar experiences or anything else you would sh share? Yeah, um, for us, um, so we raised our uh, Series A um, at the end of April, uh, beginning of May, um, and um, you know, so I, I, I've had um, Makar VC. We we started working with them. I specifically wanted to work with Omar, uh, who's on my board, um, and we were lucky enough to have multiple t term sheets. And I went with um, him simply because he was an operator and had scaled and um, had a really successful e exit. But I loved how he thought about things. It was uh, less of a uh, you know traditional VC approach, much more of an operator um, and engineer approach that I really um, get. And um, so he's brought an incredible, uh, he's become an extended team member. It, it's a great relationship, so much value add because he sees things ahead because uh, he's seen it before. Um, and so it's super valuable. Yeah, I, I think I echo what um, Pradhanya said and what Ratna said, uh, it, maybe a little bit of a different slice is um, I have found that many different investors have played different roles for us. Everything from cheerleader to connection creator to um, currently one of our investors is playing almost sort of like a CFO role where she spends an hour with our um, in-house finance department every month and kind of uh, puts a strategic lens on it. So it's like, it's really across the spectrum. And I'd say like at different points of the business, um, different parts of that have been most valuable. Um, I'm sure that everyone has heard this advice, but it's certainly been true for me. Um, we have been really, really fortunate to um, be uh, 
not, I, I don't want to say selective because like when you have to raise money, then you just raise money. But to the extent that you can do your diligence and make sure that there's sort of like a personal connection with people um, and you know that there's, they have interest in the business for all the right reasons and all that kind of stuff. I think uh, it just makes your life as an entrepreneur um, a bit easier. That's really great to hear kind of so much positive experiences out of uh, those relationships. And it sounds like you put in some effort into selecting the right investors for your, uh, for, not only for your business, but also kind of for your team to support them going forward. Um, a, a slightly different question in that, you know, all three of you have really thrived during this pandemic that we're, that we're still in at closing series A rounds. Um, adding more uh, customers, pivoting, even, um, I forgot to say this in the beginning, uh, Pradnia traveled to Dubai and represented Thai and the Thai Women Global Conference and was able to pitch on a global stage in addition to all the other experiences that she shared. And so things are, you know, moving along and everybody's adapting. Um, but I'm curious if there was any unexpected successes that you saw during this time um, that maybe but for the pandemic would not have been there necessarily. I'll I'll jump in regarding raising. Um, So we have to pitch a lot before, well, at least I I had to pitch a lot. I'm not going to speak for everybody um, before closing around. And so being able to do that um, and not have to travel was a huge time saving. So it was pretty amazing to be able to go at 9 a.m. pitch in New York and then um, at 10 pitch in Boston and then right after that pitch in the Valley and then back and forth like that um, over the the weeks that it took to to raise the round. Um, I I think it allowed me us to compress it and just to make it much more efficient and also get to know investors that I wouldn't have gotten to know. I think I got meetings that I wouldn't have gotten just because they only had to give us 30 minutes rather than, I don't know, walk in to the office. And yeah, so it allowed us to create relationships where there, there were none, get to know the investors to vet as, as Amika had said before, our investors before um, committing, um, but also just access. I think the pandemic, at least for me, was un, it's unexpectedly created access. That's, that's really cool to hear because, you know, we always hear about the time savings, but that's in a positive, definitely a positive opportunity there. What about you, Rathna or Ambika? Uh, so for me, I, I will agree. Um, my process was super efficient. Um, I wasn't going up and down Sandhill Road trying or, you know, getting from one end of the, the Bay Area to the next. Um, it, it was, um, you know, you could have five, six, seven meetings and my whole process was two weeks. <laughs> so I tried to be super efficient and, you know, you get over the hurdles of Zoom um, you know, the biggest thing is not being able to read the room, um, but you learn quickly. Um, and then, so I think it made for a, a much more efficient process. Um, yeah, so I would just add from the business's perspective for us, um, I think it gave us a uh, necessity to really look at the business with a, um, a sharper lens towards profitability that we perhaps would not have done had we not been in such a, um, frankly, scary environment, Uh, especially in our business. I probably don't need to say this twice, but we were renting clothes for women who generally went to the office every day. So that was a scary moment. Um, And so trying to figure out, you know, like, how are we going to pivot, enter any buzzword that you want, um, but essentially hold on to cash and generate new cash uh, for as long as this thing was going to persist and continues to persist. Really, it it did kind of force us to be um, meticulous about costs and opportunities um, in a way that I think was painful, but will serve us very well in the long run, just to give you like a sense we we doubled them more than doubled our margin over the period um and that did not come easily it came because we made really tough decisions that were terrifying that in a more um generous environment we may not have made but will make us stronger in the long run great thank you that's really great too um hear those perspectives very inspiring 
Uh, one final question, um, then before we kind of move into our next session here, um, is there's a lot of entrepreneurs here. There's a lot of soon to be entrepreneurs and there's a lot of entrepreneurs that have been there and are maybe serial entrepreneurs as well at this point um, on this on the Zoom. I'm curious, what is one bit of advice that has stayed with you throughout your journey um, that you would share with, that you would be open to sharing with this audience? Um, so when I was still at Sloan, some uh, some dude said to me that most um, women-led businesses die in the analysis paralysis state because women are so... Um, perfectionist oriented that they just like can't get out of their own way. And I think I say that to myself like once a day, like, am I going to keep moving? Um, or am I going to just like die in this swamp of like, Oh, it could be a little bit better if I just did this thing. Um, and so I really try to, uh, just keep the ball moving. Um, and so nothing, a little chip on your shoulder won't, uh, do for you. That's great. Thank you. What about you, uh, Pradnya? Um, my advice would be to focus on people. So the people whose problem you're solving and the people who are on your team who are going to be working tirelessly to implement your dream, essentially. And so appreciate them and to treat them well. Great. Thank you. And, and what about you, Ratna? And I would say to just be obsessed with the problem. Um, for us, it is, um, it, and it ties into your previous question as well, um, the global e-commerce is at this really interesting um, time. Um, there's so much happening. Um, COVID accelerated that. Um, it is about continuous um, evolution. Um, and, and we are, you know, we do cross-border. That means we're powering 200 plus countries. Um, and so really uh, staying focused um, on the problem um, and how that should evolve um, as the world and the trade landscape continues to evolve. I think um, that has served us well and um, it, it's it's about continuous um, um, improvement, if you will, uh, to the product. Um, and that's how I think about um, the startup world as well. It's really about learning and growing. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna check with Minnie here. Minnie, do we have the breakout rooms ready? So um, in this next session, I think she's just plugging in all the people in the different rooms. Uh, we're going to, um, first of all, I'm just kind of going to the logistics. Thank you everyone. That was a really fantastic panel. Like so many really great nuggets of wisdom. Um, really powerful to hear um, how so many of you have are just kind of riding this wave right along and really found your stride through this time in the pandemic, as well as kind of in your journey personally in your different uh, careers that got you to where you're at. Uh, for me, it's always been really helpful to hear what other women have done. Uh, personally, as a lawyer as well, I'm always inspired by lawyers who end up doing something else. Ayana, because I'm like, where's where else could I go with this? And I'm looking forward to what I might be doing in the future and hopefully looking to all three of you, especially you, Pranya, when we when I get there and getting your uh, thoughts on those experiences. And I hope uh, many of you here, I can see from the chat window, also had those same uh, sentiments as I do. Um, uh, Ty Sienna, like I said a few times here before, you know, we're trying to create these experiences and curate them the best that we can. And um, if you if you are new to entrepreneurship um, and you're looking for a network to start building from, we invite you to consider uh, joining Ty Seattle and our different activities that we do. Um, if you're a past entrepreneur, the way that we do this is by um, making those connections. We have a strong charter member base, a lot of whom are here who are seasoned professionals and have chosen Thai as a platform where they want to give back and be connected to the next generation of entrepreneurs. So that's what makes this particular network that much more powerful and having such great people who spend their time with us. Mm -hmm.